the tragedy, the wounded womb, the anatomy, metaphysics, politics, and economics of women's disease. Uh, last time, Brother Valentine brought one sword. I see he has brought two today, so he's going to be taking heads. With that, give Brother Phil Valentine a black hand. Peace. <laughs> sound too enthusiastic. <laughs> okay. I'd like to thank you, especially sisters, after knowing what the subject is, for having the courage to show up. I know you're coming based upon what it is you think I'm going to talk about. And I believe that I am about to be given several pieces of several minds based upon what it is I'm about to address. But I make no bones about it. I am a man. And I have stepped back in deference to the social tide, the social equation of the last 25 to 30 years and have surrendered uh, or given ground to uh, my leadership qualities, of my leadership qualities, in hopes that <clears throat> what was pro pro given to me or what was promoted to me as uh, the new wave for feminine principle doing their thing um, would thus be you know, I would then see the whole new light, and I would be then given uh, the, the, uh, the necessary components for myself as a man and know what to do after that. Well, I waited for near on 30 years, and I see us retrograde or regress at least 50. Now, I am not assigning blame. And as you will see, we are going to be here to discuss the problems and hopefully touch upon what may be solutions. And this is going to be interactive. It's not just you sitting there being a vegetable trying to take root in rhetoric because you know what that will sprout, more rhetoric. What I want to do now is, as I usually do, I usually preface my talks with the news of the day. And I would like to bring my brothers and sisters up to snuff with what's getting ready to happen with the Y2K and the impending demise of the financial market. First of all, I would like to make known that there are two people who are very well known, but at this point not remembered. And they're very close friends of mine. And the very fact that one of them showed up here today is a great honor for me. Uh, this brother is a friend slash mentor and one who is an intellectual adjutant. We talk hours on the phone. And brother never ceases to amaze me at his depth and insight. But beyond that, the brother is a craftsman. And I hope at one point in time we will get a chance to work together. I'm speaking about a brother who has appeared in feature films. Uh, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Anybody ever heard of that one? Yes, the brother. Yeah, he was there with Jack Nicholson. He also played in a movie called Clute with Jane Fonda, with, uh, um, who's that other white boy? Uh, you know, he's supposed to be the darling of all the women. Uh, Robert Redford in a, a movie called Brubaker. And he was in, I believe, Short Eyes. The brother is a craftsman par excellence. And the reason why you don't see more of him is because he refused to bend over and kiss anybody's ass. 
which is why I find him so endearing. So I want you all to welcome him into your heart as much as I have welcomed him. Ladies and gentlemen, just give a little round of applause. He don't want me to do this, but please give it up for brother Nathan George. Come on. Right back there, he's behind the sister in the blue. He don't like it. <laughs> he's also been on Broadway, he played in The Blacks and No Place to Be Somebody with Ron O'Neill. Anyway, I wanted to move forward, and I also want to recognize and give props to Dr. Ann Brown, who is here, sitting in the, uh, what do you call it, seat, come on. They don't like that, but I like doing that, because I like messing with them. I happened upon some information that I think you all better take notes of. And before we even get into the subject of the wounded womb, we have to deal with an immediacy that is just around the corner. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, the National Guard and other federal agencies engaged in Y2K planning are now expecting loss, losses of electrical power and other related problems before the year 2000. Nuclear power plants will begin to shut down in July, according to the government sources. As far as I'm concerned, the public has a right to know on this. It isn't classified, so I'm not violating any rules that I see. I might be hampering somebody's planning, but this needs to get out, an officer of the National Guard Bureau in Washington told WorldNet Daily in an uh, exclusive interview. The officer and several others who continue to provide information believe they will be reassigned or disciplined if their identities were made known. Then. It'll all be out of the loop, he says. The National Guard is planning something called COMEX MOBEX on May 1st. It's an exercise to practice a full mobilization of all 480,000 members of the National Guard. It will take place on May 1st. Now, I know you all have heard when pilots are going down or when there's distress, you hear, May Day, May Day. Well, May Day that May 1st had to do with a great financial um, uh, fiasco that went on in this country, as well as uh, the times that they plan uh, serious ritual assassinations around the world, or when they start creating fevers to create wars so that they could plan it in accordance with the monetary system. So May 1st, be on the lookout for maneuvers up and down your streets. You will probably be seeing some of them coming into the store, just like any one of you, probably be black, a few whites, in fatigues. You'll probably be seeing a lot of trucks. You'll most likely be very quietly seeing them slowly infiltrated and working in coordination with the police department. The exercise is planned to prepare for a possible mobilization in the event computer failures from the Y2K bug cause major disruptions of power, telecommunications, transportation, and banking. The officer believes the government should be warning people now rather than later. He says there is still time to prepare if the correct warnings are given. If people wait until the last minute, the disaster and the panic will be greater. I'm skipping down a few lines. Problems for the nation's power system will begin in July, right at the time of highest demand for power because of long sunlit hours and the need for air conditioning. Not one nuclear plant is Y2K compliant today. And there is strong indication that they will not be compliant by the end of the year. It takes at least four months to shut down a nuclear power plant. It takes four months just to shut it down. And power is needed to do that. The NRC, or Nuclear Regulatory Commission, sent out a memo saying you will shut down on July 1st, 1999. Listen to me carefully. This is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission sent out a memo to all nuclear power plants that they will shut down on July the 1st, unless you are compliant. That is 20% of the power grid 20% of the power grid, which is also equivalent 
to our strategic reserve for power. In other words, if they have to breach or go beyond the envelope of the specific amount of consumption of power that we use within a day, they can't. They will have to brown out or black out certain sections of the city, and if it is in great demand, the whole East Coast. The National Guard believes the, nation, the nation's power grid will collapse and is making plans accordingly, according to the sources. Panic and widespread unrest are expected. Now, let me just say this to you. They are not saying it may happen. Panic and widespread unrest are expected. Plans now call for a recall of all Guard members placing an average of 4,000 soldiers in each of the 120 largest cities. The COMEX MOBEX exercise will stimulate that recall, will simulate that recall with the use of special high frequency radio systems. In other words, they will be setting up makeshift towers to communicate above ground because most of the electrical conduits and most of the phone line conduits for communications will be shut down. In other words, only the police and the military will have means of communicating with each other. The latest plan I've heard said this particular person, oh, before I say that, they say they're going to be toast. They're talking about the actual system, said one of the officers who spoke to World Net News over the weekend, speaking of the nation's power grids. The latest plan I've heard, said another, is to break the power grid into several hundred little grids. Right now, it's one major grid broken into four subgrids. If they don't break it into several hundred little grids in conjunction with the phone system not working properly, they won't get their feedback mechanism right and they'll burn up all the lines. It is expected that there will be rolling blackouts and brownouts of powers in the city with no power at all in the rural areas. All available power will be directed to, to cities with nothing left to send to the lower populations. It takes a mile long train. Now they were talking about seeing if they could switch to coal power. It takes a mile long train per day to feed a coal fired power plant. If the train system goes down, forget it. The trains are going to work, but you won't be able to track anything because the track is on the grid. Say you're trying to get from St. Louis to Chicago. You, well, you might end up in Des Moines because the switches aren't working properly. If the switches go haywire, you get derailments. Your average power plant only has a four-day supply of fuel. Four days. So even if the grid works properly, they can't get the fuel there. We're looking at a strategic oil depots, all the depots around the country, and we're going to make plans to commandeer them. This is FEMA talking. This is going to be a joint FEMA-US government type thing, explains one. So obviously, FEMA is not the government. He gave an example of oil imported from Venezuela. That oil makes up 17% of the nation's supply. The oil that is imported from Venezuela is 17% of the nation's supply. 17%. At least three of the five refineries in Venezuela are planning to shut down at the end of the year. That loss will impact a minimum of 10% of the nation's oil. And Venezuela is only a small oil supplier. Large nations sending refined oil to the U.S. are in a similar situation. The power plants among the pipelines may not be able to operate because of Y2K, creating another danger. If the pipe freezes and could burst, in, uh, in order to avoid that, this deficit, the pipeline may have to be shut down before the year 2000. Oil refineries are another problem. The National Guard has information which indicates that few of the refineries will be able to operate in the year 2000, and they too will need to shut down early to avoid the dangerous situation. When this hits 
or the Y2K, some of the valves are automatically going to shut off and you're going to get a similar thing to what happens in a water hammer, what is called a water hammer. You'll get pipes bursting at these plants. They, the National Guard and FEMA, expect most of the refineries to shut down. It's cheaper to build a new refinery than it is to pull all of the embedded chips out of the old one. We got a pretty good intelligence that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. However, it caught the common public off guard. That was nonsense because that was planned to get you into the war. It's the same type of situation, they're saying. Suddenly, Clinton's going to be our savior and rescue us. Well, that's not going to happen. He'll be the good guy just as Y2K is hitting, or he may be, or may be in a month or so ahead of time. But as matters get worse, he'll become the bad guy. Our nation's society is a three-pronged stool of power, telecom and banking. Power, oil power, telecom, and banking. Take any of these legs out and we're gone. The whole thing collapses underneath it. You complicate that with just in-time manufacturing, consumer confidence, and then you start looking at the other critical modes or nodes and start seeing, especially in the power production, the dependencies which are required. You need power to generate power, and if any time, you have a logistical situation where dependencies loop in on themselves, that's always bad. In many of the previous programs that I spoke about, I keep telling folks, get ready. We told you, what, five years ago at the Gathering of the Masters, I was talking to a brother who was looking at it then, that it's time for you to start squirreling away food. Well, it's time for you to start squirreling away that food because when the Y2K hits, you come up to my door looking for something, I'm sorry, Reverend Valentine ain't home. Well, we are here, and we are packed whenever we start talking about women. The sisters come out. They either come in to tell me about myself, or they're really coming to listen this time. I hope it's the latter. Because everything that we've been doing in the last 25 to 30 years ain't been working. As a naturopath, I have seen the carnage. I have seen the madness that my sisters suffer. Because every time something happens to you, it usually happens to your reproductive system. And we're going to talk about the wounded womb and why that is. Now, you may not like what you're hearing, because I can't give you solutions immediately to what you need to do. But I will tell you what the problem is, and then, based upon your own ability to investigate, or based upon the sisters getting together with the information that I'm going to give you, hey, you never know. Because essentially, the revolution is going to begin with the sisters this time. But they cannot be out front. They cannot be out front. It's proven it in the last 30 years. You can't sustain the warfare that way. Now, I have a little prepared something I need to say so that I can put it into the record. Please bear with me. What we are about to share and discuss here today will not be heard on Oprah Winfrey or Barbara Walters, so don't look for it. And that's a shame because a conscientious study of the metaphysics, politics, and economics of women's diseases would pave the way for alleviating the chronic ignorance and uncertainty that presently demands or detriments or determines the tragic course of melanated people in this society. I'm not here to pass any judgments, but to render observations and calculated determinations based on 23 years of experience in the fields of metaphysics and natural healing. For this videotape, this special time with you and I, for us to really share and get real meaning from this, for this session not to end up being just another quick fix exercise in delusional, stroke your neck, tickle your clit, psychobabble, 
this new age bullshit that has been given to our sisters to come into themselves. I urgently request that the women here with me and you sisters out there in TV land gathered around the television because your girlfriend said, you got to come and check this out. I urgently request you to come and be in this moment. This moment will be self-examination of your mental inventory of accumulated garbage. I wish to challenge your intellectual inventory. I wish to challenge your emotional inventory. I wish to challenge your psychological inventory. I wish to challenge your physiological inventory. I request that everything that you have brought here today be deleted. Forget everything that you think that you knew about yourself. Forget everything Essence and Susan Taylor told you. Forget everything Oprah told you. Forget everything Terry McMillan told you. Forget everything Alice Walker told you. Forget everything your doctor told you. Forget everything your gynecologist told you. Forget everything you learned in college. Forget what you learned in therapy and in these new age women encounter groups because they're all feel good. Get to know yourself. It's all about acclamation and surrender. And again, this is not criticizing. This is not to castigate. I'm simply speaking with passion. And my passion is sometimes misconstrued for belligerence. I'm not belligerent. I love the hell and the heaven out of my sisters. Empty your reactive minds of everything you defend, sister. Everything you defend. Because most of you, or some of you, have come here to defend who you are. And everything, or some of the things I'm going to say here, you're going to feel very offended with. I hope so. Because then we'll be in for some dialogue. True dialogue. If we're just here to go back and forth emotionally, then it's not going to work. Empty your reactive minds of the belief structures that feminism has subliminally implanted through education, entertainment, politics, and economics. Allow me to introduce you to the forgotten archetypal woman, the first woman. Allow me to show you who she was so that you can awaken to who you presently are not. Allow me to introduce you to the archetypal man Allow me to show you how much like him you have now become. The underlying principle operating to the detriment of women's health is that this civilization has lost all respect for the immutable laws governing the hermetic principles of gender. We have belligerently continued to flagrantly disobey these divine laws which govern the differences. The differences, beloved brothers and sisters. There is no such thing as equality. That's the biggest rhetoric of bullshit that has been pushed on us today, is that you are equal. Your actions do not make you equal. It just shows how unequal you are to man because of the amount of diseases that are cropped up in the last 30 years. There is no such thing as equality. You've bought it hook, line, and sinker, and you've been pulled onto the boat of that fisherman that has been, s been plucking you out of the water each time and then looking at you like they're doing the fishing shows and then throwing you back just to catch you again. Our ancient cultures established behavioral ethics based on these gender differences. Let me say this again, beloved sisters and brothers. Our ancient cultures established behavioral ethics based on these gender differences. Ethical behavior that came about as a result of intelligent, harmonious interrelationships with natural law. Laws which today feminism wants you to believe were somehow concocted by men to enslave women. You see, the gender differences celebrated and even worshipped by our ancestors since the dawn of time 
are the specific targets of attack by Amazonian feminists. For the last 35 years, they have mounted a successful attack against proper gender conduct, a protracted attack to eliminate all of the natural boundaries and differences of conduct and occupation that protects the internal biological integrity of both the man and the woman. What does he mean by that? The things that you now so haphazardly and for, taken for grantedly do today, your ancestors would look at you in awe as women. You see this woman, this white woman, coming up on a horse straddled on this hard saddle with her vagina hitting this horse's uh, back. And you say, well, whoa, that's a powerful looking sister. The Native American women looked at her like she was out of her mind. But you sisters go out riding bikes, and it's the same thing. <gasps> Brother Valentine, riding bikes? Yes. Anytime you straddle anything that is harder than your vagina, you think about that, sisters. And we're going to get into that a lot deeper. The feminist branch of the neo-sex phenomenon, neo meaning new. See, I know that most of the people that's leading these sisters today are the neo-niggers. <laughs> we got a lot of neo-niggers. And you could see them in Ebony every month. You could see them in Essence every month. You could see them on the television when they want the black opinion. Neo niggas is just those same Negroes that was in the house telling Massa when he got sick, Massa is we sick? Just wanted to be with Massa. Well, neo niggas have followed the feminists. And it's not just the blacks that are being suffering by it. The world suffers by this particular energy, this Western civilization. And we're going to discuss why feminism has been given such a heavy platform today and how it grew in power as it did. And what effects you sisters have suffered as a result of that. The feminist branch of the neo-sex phenomenon wants us as melanin peoples to believe that by some haphazard quark of fate or some monumental blunder of chance, Mother Nature herself actually made a mistake when designing the human body. Primarily the reproductive system and hormonal circuitry of both man and woman. Her biggest mistake, according to feminists, was in giving us gender-specific instincts with which to internally govern and regulate body functions through proper behavioral activities favorable to maintaining the biostasis of each. And I got that word biostasis from Dr. Ann Brown. <laughs> she she give me all them fancy words to work with. As ludicrous as this may sound, the fact remains that the above represents the philosophical fuel driving the vehicle of feminism and all other related isms and as a result of this boycott of your natural instincts and our disrespect for the divine principles of gender, this has our species suffering what amounts to being a terminal fate. Lastly, I don't care to verify any scientific findings concerning women's diseases. I've studied enough scientific statistics and even added a few to my book called The Wounded Womb. Science be damned. Common sense be the goal. But you say, Reverend Valentine, how can we have common sense without scientific analysis of the problem? Easy. Common sense was our ancestors' science. All formulas for the sciences of being and behavior grew from the intuitive pool of common sense. Western medical science and all of the reeking intellectual horseshit you've been mentally digesting as your education was based on an ecclesiastical belief system that teaches you to become a legalized dope pusher. And when I say dope pusher, 
I mean dope dealer from both perspectives, the kind that you give people by prescription and the kind that you dispense to people as professional advice. The same advice that can't save you as a doctor from contracting the same damn diseases you claim to be healing people of. Now, don't I sound belligerent? I'm not. Because when you see what I'm about to unfold for my sisters, and you see what it is that we have to face as a people, and what it is and how intrinsic and how subtle and how devious the plan was to separate us, the man and the woman, from each other, and how to play the game of power between the two in the home, you'll understand why our sisters are suffering here today. Now before I go on at the break, when we do have our break, and brother will tell me when we have our break, I want to let you know that we will have specific pieces of information dealing with solutions. This is an extrapolation from a book that I'm writing called Neogenesis. This is called The Sacred Principles of Health. This was the original name of a book that you might all know called Heal Thyself. Have you heard of it? Yeah. Oh, really? Well, this was the original name. And you say, well, I've heard brothers and sisters say, well, you were married to Queen of Fuba? No, you weren't. Yes, I was. I'll show you a wedding picture. Take a close up of this. Down here. Are you up on it? That's me, grinning like a Cheshire cat, and that's her looking just as silly. This is a wedding. You know who that is? That was my best man. You know who that is? M. Hotep Gary Bird. Can I get a witness? Yeah, I have witnesses. You know who married us? Dr. John Moore, the hobo herbologist. Old John Moore, before he passed or was assassinated. So when I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm saying it to be real. This whole thing, a lot of brothers and sisters, especially sisters who knew us from way back then, says, it's time that you come out and start saying something about this whole thing. And I, I say, it's not necessary. Yes, it's necessary, because sister's about to come out with a book called The Sacred Woman. The Sacred Woman, really? Well, that's a little something that I had something to do with as well. And again, this is no aspersions because I'm clearing the air. Sister put in the book Heal Thyself something called The Twelve Principles of the Sacred Woman, which I wrote for her. So if you're reading about how to become the Twelve Principles of the Sacred Woman, I wrote it. At one time, we were supposed to put together the goddess principle, and this is when we were together. We were very happy, and we said, well, what is it that we could help sisters with so that they could flourish and know how to heal themselves and become women? Well, it was supposed to be the goddess principle. Well, Brother Samaj, at the time, we were talking to him, said, well, goddess is too much Greek. All right, well, let's deal with the sacred woman. I came up, sacred woman, the 12 principles of the sacred woman. And I'm hoping, and the reason why I'm saying this now and putting it on the record as of this date is I'm hoping that when the book comes out, she did not put this in again without getting my permission, because she did it the last time. Clearing the air, brothers and sisters, because a lot of brothers have been sitting in the back. I don't care what it is our personal life was about. That ain't none of your business. But when it comes to dealing with money and business, and she's dealing with money in business, and people are telling me I better deal with money in business, well, it's time for me to start taking a little bit of credit, which is something that I have never been doing. So if you want to deal with that, we have it over there, this book as well. And as we go along, I want you all to get your pencils and paper, because we're going to be doing a candida test. We're going to find out just what your true disease is. Because do you know, sisters, that candida can emulate at least 15 different types of symptoms that doctors don't understand or realize? When they can't diagnose it, diagnose it nine times out of 10, it's candida related. So what we have here and what I put together is a candida test. So you can take it 
or you can buy it and have your girlfriends go through it, have a circle and a sit down to find out what score you get, and invariably, 90% of you will have some form of symptom based upon candida. Now, my sisters are waiting eagerly for solutions, for me to tell them what it is that they've been doing wrong. Well, let's just start with the first thing, and that's career. Oh, Reverend Valentine, are you out of your mind? Yes, careers. The word career is etymologically derived from the word combat. Do you know that? So essentially, when this society under feminism has given you the permission to go out and get a career, they have ignominiously made you a combatant for them. Your chief leader, Ms. Billary Clinton, is now going around on the stump to see whether or not you sisters will love her and vote for her. She was at the Manhattan's lab school, the O'Henry Learning Center, where she spoke about the status of women in sports. And we're going to talk about women in sports. We are pleased to celebrate today that more women and girls are learning to read and write, and often for the first time. Nations and families are investing in girls' education for the first time. We are also pleased that women are living longer and healthier lives, and that more of us are surviving childbirth as we gain greater access to health care and reproductive services. Longer, healthier lives. Happy? No. Longer? No. Because you're dropping dead at twice the rate of men today. From heart attacks, from brain aneurysms. But while more and more countries are embracing women's rights, some are holding firm or implementing policies that adversely affect women, she said. The First Lady lashed out at Afghanistan for rigidly conservative Islamic, um, uh, what is it, Tabalan regime that restricts the activities of women. Women used to be half of the Afghan doctors. Now they are forbidden to practice medicine. Ooh, I wonder why. Whose medicine are they practicing? And who had to gain control of the country? The men. And I know I said, well, who does he think he is? I know who I am. And I know what it's going to take. And I'm talking to men, too. Because as, as uh, what's his name said on, on HBO, uh, uh, George Carlin, there has been a serious pussification of men. We just seem to cower every time. And we have gotten this particular view that this loud ass black woman on, 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 on Springer and all the rest of them talking down to some brother slouched in his seat. That ain't the picture here. That's bullshit. That's what they want you to believe. Women used to be half the teachers. Now they're barred from teaching. I wonder why. What were they teaching? We've heard, all of us, stories of women being flogged with cables and then their ankles, for, for showing their ankles, they're being flogged. The first lady shifts gears in the afternoon going to the glossy hardwood basketball court of the lab school. There she promoted the upcoming HBO documentary on the struggle of women in sports called Dare to Compete. It's the title that many New York Democrats hope Clinton will take to heart as she decides whether she will run for re from retiring Democrat uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's seat next year. Now they go on to the next stage, and this woman named Sophia Toti, a member of the lab school's girls, ba girls basketball team, 
couldn't resist ribbing Mrs. Clinton about the potential Senate bid. While introducing Clinton to the audience, Toti said or noted that the First Lady was sharing the stage yesterday with tennis great Billie Jean King, Olympic gymnast Dominique Dawes, and WNBA Nikki McCray. Here we have a tennis legend, a basketball hero, and an Olympic athlete, and hopefully a runner. Clinton noted how much sports had changed for women since their high school days when girls played only half-court basketball and could only dribble the ball twice before passing. We asked, how come we can't play by the same rules as the boys? Clinton said, we were always told, well, we're sorry because we just don't think girls' hearts can take that much exertion. And guess what? They were right. You see, the people or the entities you see running up and down playing women's basketball are not all women. <laughs> Take a close-up shot of the faces of these termagants, these testosterone-toxic, unfortunate women These are females, not women. Big difference. A woman is a state of mind, and that state of mind is based upon her intrinsic archetypal instincts at proper gender conduct and behavior. This is not proper gender conduct and behavior. I don't care what you're ready to argue me with. You're not going to win, sister because you are simply imitating. You are not innovating. After I've seen Michael Jordan, I ain't paying money to see this. Show me something that sisters do that I can't do, that I will respect. And I know a couple of things that you could do immediately that blows my mind. But now, there is this thing attached to that. We will get into women in sports as well, or females in sports. But we will discuss the specific pervasive mentology of how women are actually pigeonholed or marginalized to think nowadays. Women are creatures of information, like my good brother. Uh, uh, he's one of the few Caucasians that I would actually talk and have a discussion with. His name is George Silos there. Let's have a hand for him right there. I know you are we are, there's a few of them that come in here every now and then. <laughs> this man went in and joined the Ethiopian Coptic Church. Now, I don't know why I told him, listen, stay out. He said, no, I have to do it. I said, go ahead. So I talked to him from the white perspective. And he knows how I feel about it. You know I'm right. I would tell your boy Clinton that he's a Caucasoid devil. And he'd say, yeah, you're probably right. He would say that. But I am speaking specifically about when the science is correct and it's adaptable and I could speak to it. Yes, I will speak to it. Here is your Dr. Joyce Brothers. Now this woman is a feminist. She's a closet feminist. And her writings will tell you that. This comes out of one of these newspapers, because I like to clip little things, because since y'all are so much into reading newspapers, I decided to say, well, boys will be boys, but why? She's going to tell you. Everyone teaching about men is women today. Men don't talk about men anymore. Women tell you what a man's supposed to be. You're supposed to deal with my feelings. You don't give me a chance to talk. Well, I don't get a chance to say anything either. In all countries, men commit far more crimes than women do. Listen to how she begins. How much can we attribute to the way we rear our children? Should we rear boys more like girls? Look! 
And there are women who will read this and probably, in essence, will find a definitive ex ex exponential explanation of what this means. Should we rear boys more like girls? How much do we know about this subject? Here's a chance to compare your views with those who have studied the subject. Young boys and girls get along with each other in a basically the same way. It's only later that they change, true or false. Write it down. There's no genetic reason why girls usually have more social graces. Now remember, these questions are subtle statements. How you, how you embed an idea, how you form the specific sentence so that you may be able to embed a perception without making it look like you're trying to teach something is to put it in these stupid things that people come to. This is your junk food literature. And people eat a hell of a lot of junk food in this society. There are no firm predictors of sexual orientation. A child's sexual identity isn't firmly established until after puberty. Boys need less cuddling than girls do. This is all true and false. You're supposed to say true or false. Boys are just as likely as girls to report sexual molestation. Girls are much more imaginative than boys are. Listen. First one, false. Young boys and girls get along with each other in basically the same way. It's only that they change later. False. According to linguist and author Deborah Tamman, remember, most of the people forming the opinions and giving you what the opinions are are these trained psychologists, mostly white females, who give you what you're supposed to think couched in some form of open discussion that you can make up your mind about. According to linguist and author Dr. Deborah Tannen, when girls play in groups, they tend to make suggestions rather than give orders. Boys tend to play in larger groups in which there are definitive winners and losers. Talk for boys is a way of negotiating status. OK. Is that where I'm supposed to be? Fine. I'll teach my son that. The second answer, there's no genetic reason why girls usually have more social graces. False. There is some genetic reason why girls find socializing easier than boys and why girls have more social graces. This superior social intelligence, listen to the choice of words. This superior. Now, this is, listen to the words that she's assigning to when she's describing the female principle. And, and you have to understand how subtle this is working. Listen again. There is some genetic reason why girls find socializing easier than boys and why girls have more social graces. This superior social intelligence is all in the chromosomes. Go ahead, girls. Don't understand that socialization for men and socialization for women are different. And that men socialize through physical activity and expression, not sitting down and talking back and forth all the time. That is a feminine way of socializing. There are other social cues and specific things we do to socialize. But you would never know that. Because most of the masculine citadels of socialization were torn down by feminism in the last 25 years. The nerve of some of these feminists kicking in the locker room door while men are changing because they say they want to get what? An interview? And if you kick them out, you're the one that's got the problem? You want to know why? You don't know how men socialize anymore? Because there are no more citadels of socialization. The gym where we used to go, the places where we used to lift weights, the places where we would go just to be men, no longer exist. 
but everywhere in this godforsaken piece of dirt called the United States, you can find a fucking woman sent on every goddamn corner. And I'm angry with that. <laughs> I'm pissed off. And you say, well, we women, just because we women can get together and do our thing better than you can, and we can socialize better than you can, doesn't mean you have to be angry with us. No. It was because of your goddess, your mentor, Gloria Steinem, that none of these things exist anymore. And I'm not talking to you, sisters. I'm talking into space. I'm talking into wherever it is that it will mean something to you. Fourth question. There are no firm predictors of sexual orientation. True. In other words, you have a little boy with a penis and you have a little girl with a vagina, you can't tell sexual orientation. Think about that. You are so stupid that you can't tell what a penis is for. So there's no firm predictors for sexual orientation. The very fact you have genitals predicts your sexual orientation unless there is some physiological anomaly, genetic or otherwise, environmental or otherwise, psychological or otherwise, to cause that anomaly to happen. You think about that. We still don't know exactly what makes some homosexuals and other heterosexuals, others heterosexual. But according to Dr. Kenneth Zucker of the Institute of Psychology, and boy, did I have a fun time at the psychologist's convention a few weeks ago, in Toronto, adolescent exploration is less of a predictor of adult orientation than our childhood play preferences, the kind of toys and games they enjoy. So if a boy is constantly playing with dolls, there's no problem. If your girl wants to learn to shoot and play with trucks, give them to her. There's no problem. We define sexual orientation in this society now. So now you and your particular pathology is protected by feminism. Because in the workplace today, you sisters know it, they're all over. Sisters call me up every day talking about the fact that they cannot have peace, not because of the men harassing them, but the dykes harassing them. I get those calls, truly. And you wonder, why is it that I be able to say these things? Because, sisters, I'm the one that hears it all. So I had to make a clear assessment of the fact that the specific conditions you are operating in have to be examined. Because you're making more money now than you ever have. You got the positions, the PhDs, the MAs, you got it all now. What's the matter? Psychologists, behavioral people, all kinds of workshops are blossoming. People are getting rich because of your ignorance of self. We got more people now counseling in you on relationship and the divorce rate continues to skyrocket. What the fuck does that mean? Five, a child's sexual identity isn't firmly established until after puberty. False. Usually a child's sexual identity is firmly established by age four. Now, let's go back to four. It says here, we still don't know exactly what makes some heterosexual homosexual. But according to them, adolescent exploration is less of an indicator of adult orientation. Yet still in five, they say usually a child's sexual identity is firmly established by age four. Double talk, double speak. Six, boys need less cuddling than girls do. And I can tell you the answer to that. Boys need just as much loving touch as girls do. They also need to be able to express their feelings freely without fear of scorn. Boys need to learn to be sensitive and gentle even as they continue to play and roughhouse and tumble. Could you imagine? What that's going to be like when you get two boys together who have to get up constantly to apologize to each other? Did I hurt you? Did you sensitive? What's this bullshit? The feminists are orchestrating your behavior. And I'm sorry, sisters. This is raw. This is real. 
I do a little bit of swearing in and out of the discussion because it's to show you that we're adults here. And it ain't like you ain't never heard this before. We're being real here. We're being raw. It's Red Fox in holism. <laughs> Number seven, boys are just as likely as girls to report sexual molestation. False. Well, number eight, girls are much more imaginative than boys. Now, here's this answer. False. Boys are not necessarily less imaginative than girls are. In fact, one study showed that boys pass as much as one quarter of their playtime fantasizing about adventures, whereas girls were far less likely to act on an unrealistic escapade. Why? Because women are creatures Computer lie. They're computerized creatures who are ready to take orders, cues based upon what is provided. Men are problem solvers by nature. So imagination must run wild. That is the field where a boy learns to deal with problem solving. He deals with three dimensionality a hell of a lot more proficiently than women do, and they've done the tests. Specifically because by his nature, he has to have, by because he is a provider and a protector, he must come up with more imaginative ways to act upon being a good provider and protector. Woman is nurturer, comforter, and establisher. Now, this gender difference no longer exists because you have a political mindset and an agenda for money and the bottom line of power to maintain a separation of the genders and then to put a schism of equality between them so that you no longer need one another. And now you suffer for the need of the other and you can't find the other anymore. So now all of these diseases based upon that lack, upon that, that, that inability to interface with your other half, you have to raise that other half within you. And that's why that stress begins to start growing here on your chest, on your nipples, and on your face. A lot of sisters were saying, well, why is it that you can't find a good man anymore, especially the corporate heads? Well, sisters, the reason why you can't find a good man anymore is because you've become the good man. Them sisters in waiting to exhale blew my mind. <laughs> blew my mind. The reason why you're sitting around talking about men this way is because you haven't sat around and talked about yourselves yet. What are you doing that's saying to men, you can take care of yourself? <laughs> cool. Bye. If you don't enact that feeling within a man that he feels like he's worth something, you say, well, it, no more playing like you don't know what to do. Assert yourself, girl. You know you can do it. Why do you have to play any ears? <coughs> Essentially, the courting game is just what it is, a game. But when you're dealing with relationships, it's dealing with primal forces. If you think that you are going to pretend to be just as eloquent, don't pretend you're not intelligent. We're not asking you to be stupid. We're not asking you to be not intelligent, but when society forces you to act and play my role of problem solver, provider, and protector, what need am I for? Where am I gonna fit in? Who am I to you? Am I your organic dildo? If that's the case, I'm in and out then. And that's exactly what you sisters keep telling me the problem is. You can't keep a relationship. Because the men don't give a damn. They're in one time, they come for a little while, gone. Well, that's how we've been trained, especially black men. Because we weren't supposed to be taking care of the children that came from a bonding. White man told us, just make the babies. You ain't got to be a father. Breed so my society can succeed. And that legacy is now anywhere the white man has touched and anywhere, quote unquote, slavery has touched. That particular mentality has been handed down to the male. And that's where we're fucked up. A few of us tried to get it together in the 60s. You saw it. That's when men were men. That's when men were ready to die. But now, let's talk. 
Ain't you talked enough? The reason why they want you to talk is because that's what women do. There's enough talk. When you empty 41 shells of the man, you don't talk no more. How do you talk around that? What do you say? Oh, we could have just pulled up the finger action a little bit or maybe just put it on semi-automatic. What are we talking about here? There's nothing to talk about. There's too much goddamn talking. Look at this bullshit. You want to know what an industry this bullshit is? They got a magazine about divorce. Name divorce. Where you can get lawyers. This is bullshit. And they got the woman on there. Stress and sleep. Look. Divorce-related stress may be stealing your sleep. Here's help. And women will always be the consumers of information because they are information gatherers. Just as they were well, the gatherers when they be gathering the berries, they gather information the same way. So this is the information age. Let's flood the whole, what is it, virtual reality with information. Let's keep them talking to one another instead of acting upon the condition that they're in. Let's have them all going to school. Girl, get your diploma. Girl, go and get that education. Sit down, in other words, and talk and listen some more. Here they are in the workplace. Women who are childless are all pissed off now with women who have children. Oh, here, here we go. And who they have here as your mentor? Who is this Audrey Hepburn lookalike female again? What's her name? I don't know. She's in this thing where it's on Channel 5 where she's this lawyer. Yeah. Ali McButterville, you know. <laughs> I mean, you, you really like this, this woman? What fucking endearing qualities you have with this? She's this clueless female. How the hell did she finish law when she acts like this dullard? And you're supposed to believe this. Well, here's what she represents here. The best article in this month's Mirabella, and <laughs> where is that? The best article in this month's Mirabella isn't even billed on the cover. Journalist Eleanor Bunkett, or Bur Burkett, documents the rising anger of childless women who feel they are carrying the load for mommies who work. Oh, no. oh yes. <laughs> Wait, stop now. Don't get an attitude. This is what she says. They have a point. Oh, it's deep. They have a point. More than one, in fact. First of all, consider that the single and childless are not an insignificant minority anymore. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's the fastest growing segment of the workforce. One fifth of women born between 1946 and 1964 are childless. Some of those in the, in, uh, in the cohort are complaining about unequal treatment at work, forced to stay late and work weekends because parents won't benefit package that favor families but not defend their own, or they're not being offered flex time. Is this brave new family friendly world another kind of corporate welfare program? <laughs> welfare for parents intent on having their progeny without losing steam at work for, or compromising their cushy lifestyles? Cushy. It's a fair question, this other woman says and one that must be addressed as we strive to create a working environment that supports families, but not at the expense of the, mm, child-free. <laughs> now, this sounds funny, but these are the prevailing mindsets that are operating everywhere you go in the workforce, my sisters. And they have made this the mindset. In other words, there are trends that sisters like to adopt. If there's a specific type of airing, a specific something they like, 
This is what they will go for. You are, by nature, consumers. So what do you consume? Not only what you buy and wear and adorn, but you consume information, programming, and indoctrination as well. Now, I know you don't like hearing that, but I'm going to show you how you do it. It is now unconscious. Here you have this woman who has now shown you how to become famous by controlling your gag reflex. Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> Monica Lewinsky is now an icon of her generation. Wait. <laughs> I want you to see what feminism has done to you sisters. And you all are not crying out. Oh. <laughs> well, some of you all are crying out. <laughs> <laughs> just by the way, just want to introduce another beautiful sister that just came in the room, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries. Come on, let's give it up for her. <laughs> okay, I hear you, sister, but here I have to say it anyway because this is going out to women who do. I know what you're saying. We're going to talk on all of that. But I have to first go to, I have to go to the videotape, like they say. I'd like to make a contribution to the world, Monica Lewinsky told Barbara Walters on, on Wednesday, adding with winning self-depreciation, a good one this time. I wanted to shout back, girlfriend, you just did. In Lewinsky's two-hour interview with Walters, her first conversation with any member of the mass media, she gave 70 million viewers a riveting crash course in the peculiar contradictions of being a young woman in the 90s. Contradictions? What contradiction? The contradiction is to common sense, to logic, to reason, and to why is it that they are promoting this crap in deference to what it is you're supposed to be thinking about, sister. Revolution, change, and helping your man to rise as well. But we are, have no, there is no dearth of information for Je Monica Lewinsky. M Lewinsky was expressing her generation's irreverence and lust for life, its inheritance of the women's movement and the sexual revolution. And Walters was left wondering for Lewinsky, where on earth does she go from here? Was Lewinsky using her power to take over the world? What? What power? What made her famous? Is that how to conquer the world? I'm telling you, sisters, this is what they're giving you. And guess what? She was the talk because I was in a, I had to go and visit a good friend of mine who came in with a concert. She's a concert promoter. And she was there with her good friends. And, and they were there. And I had to give her a consultation. She's sick as a dog. But as I'm talking to her, she's looking at her watch. And I'm saying, what's going on? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Reverend Valentine. The Lewinsky thing is coming on. I'm saying, what? She says, well, you know, I'm so, well, I know you think ill of me, and I'm saying, I can't believe it. No, she's not going to stop what I am helping her to do with herself, her suffering. She wants to shut me up so that she doesn't miss this. Sisters, you don't see it. You don't see it. I do. I see it. No protest to this crap. Two mothers for Zachary. She's fallen in love with another woman. Does that give her mother the right to take her child away? Based on a true story. <coughs> Sex amongst equals. I love Thursdays because you see so much stupidity in here. 
you can actually write, and you could put up a whole mosaic that will cover the Holland Tunnel. <laughs> Sex amongst equals in our culture is pleasure for him, frustration for her. Women are not inherently less orgasmic than men. In fact, women are physically capable of multiple orgasms. Women who have sex with female partners climax 83% of the time, with men only 29% of the time. Uh, that's a goddamn lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Wait, <laughs> my sister. I'm only reading it. I'm only reading it. I'm only reading this. Now, yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Next. I want you to see something here. Now, this has to do with your womb. And we're going to talk about fibroids. We're going to talk about it all. I'm just giving you what it is that you are looking at every day. And it's time that when you open that newspaper up or when you open that stupid magazine Essence up and you start looking at that stupid shit, they got every page is about boiling and oiling your hair. I can't even believe. I see some of the sister in this rap. I was looking, I was thumbing it because my, my son dances on these videos. And I'm looking for his thing, and I see this black, black woman with this dead, dead straight hair. Dead straight. I'm talking about they have it on the bottle. Dead straight. <laughs> and I'm saying, my God, what does this mean? Well, I'll show you what it means. This was in the Long Island voice. And the cover says, eek, I'm a woman trapped in a woman's body. <laughs> what? <laughs> and of course they say, ah, oh, that looks interesting. And when you pick it up, here's what you find. In this magazine, there is this. Okay? Now, I want you to see what the new woman thinks about herself or what they want you to think about yourself when it comes to doing the prime directive that your physiology was designed for. It says here, anatomy of a new mom. Needs a perm. Wonders why. <laughs> Mashed potatoes for brains. Can speak only in monosyllables. Can't snap, can, could snap at any time. Feeds infant, but forgets to feed self. Now wait. Teeth gritting while the precious parasite clamps down on a cracked nipple. <laughs> Everything out there now, my sisters, is to get you to stop procreating. Especially melanated peoples. There is the global 2000 scenario of the destruction of people of color, 2.6 billion people of color must die by the year 2010. Why? Because by 2010, white people will not be able to keep up with the exponentially growing population of dark folks in dark lands. So a particular, hmm? a particular global scenario has been carried out in everything we do. That is why feminism was promoted to the front especially a branch of feminism I have called Amazonian feminism. Also, bags from lack of sleep, neck sore from oogling, back sore from relentless bending over a changing table, plugged milk ducts, swelling, leaking nipples, IV bruises from labor complication. Well, if you stayed your ass at home, that wouldn't happen. Swap sway back stance to support little schnookums. 
Bigger thighs than ever before. New hands from constant, wait a minute, chapped hands from constant wiping. Relics from pre-baby days. Now she's carrying a bucket from everything that she used to be. Creative. I would think that the epitome of your creativity is suckling at your breast. But they put lost relics. Your creativity is gone. I would think a mother is the most creative person on the planet. Solitude. That means you don't have your husband around. All right? Focus. No more focus. No more spontaneity. No more travel. No more romance. No more relations. No more sex. No more food. No more fun. And here it is. Unshaved legs. And you have a man down here saying, see you tonight, honey, for supper. Let's have the rock Cornish hen and the seeds of Caesar salad, OK, honey? Varicose veins from the, from the third trimester. Still, mate is interested in humping. Must wear cotexes the size of sofa cushions. <laughs> the most fun is taking a sitz bath. Hemorrhoids from the labor. Stomach bloated and loose like uncoagulated jello. Baby likes to scream for no reason around well-meaning relatives. Baby totally oblivious. This is, this is the description of the baby. Totally oblivious and blissed out need machine. Notice, yes, an insult to motherhood. OK, this is what I'm saying to you, beloved. Who wrote this today? Uh, may I offer you an eating disorder with your pregnancy, ma'am? Fear and Fat in the Post-Feminist Age by Jennifer Cornrich. Jennifer Cornrich or Cornrich. <laughs> Liz is wary of busybodies asking when she's going to have a baby. Seeing now, the answer might well be never. Not because she's infertile. Not because her husband is shooting blanks. Not because the couple is afford can't afford the child nor because Liz, not her real name, is worried it will derail her writing career, not even because she loathes to have a child. She just doesn't want to incubate and give birth to it. That's right, Liz is unconcerned if she will ever be a mother simply because she recoils from the notion of pregnancy itself. This, my beloved sisters, is what is known as a teratogen. This, my beloved brothers and sisters, is what is known as a testosterone toxic female who, because of the fact that the testosterone enzyme, the testosterone hormone, has interfaced with her germ plasm and now affected the nucleus of the cell, it now creates the specific mentology, it changes her disposition, so now she no longer feels she needs to even breastfeed, she doesn't want to do anything that has to do with motherhood because she's too busy with yanging. They talk about gang banging? Well, sisters are gang yanging. Why are you wearing men's underwear? And don't tell me it's comfortable because I see that you are buying the men's underwear with the open fly. Is there a reason why you have an open fly with the men's underwear? Now, it's cute just after, you know. You got to run up and go to the bathroom, and you got to get something on real quick to go there. Why are you wearing it under your skirt? Why are you wearing it with pants, which is what you're not supposed to be wearing in the first place? But this is cute. And it says it's only natural. Oh, really? And then they, of course, explain it in very tiny words natural cotton. But it's only natural to be like a man in this, this day and age. Pardon me while I change the tape. Say that again. Oh, we got time. I'm going to go over it all. Here's something that George wrote. 
And it says, are you a bull or are you hamburger meat? American women and the harem master. Now, he says milk cows have calves each year in order to be able to produce milk. Their calves are taken from them at birth and raised by meat producers to become milk-fed veal. Bulls don't permit calves to be taken from their cows, nor cows to be removed from the herd. To prevent the bulls from interfering with this practice, they are castrated, called steers, and eventually are led to slaughter to become hamburger meat. Does that sound familiar? Human societies complain about this practice that denies bulls and cows the opportunity to raise their offspring. They also complain about the treatment of calves that live in cages as they are raised to become milk-fed veal. But in our society, women are separated from the fathers of their children and like the cows are hooked to the treadmill of the production. The children aren't raised by the parents either and like the calves who are raised by the third party, they are raised by the state. The third party is the state. If the fathers complain, then they, like the bulls, are emasculated. If they don't like this emasculation, they are put in cages to live. Human societies do not complain about children raised without parents. They don't complain about men living in cages either. That's very, very insightful. Are you a bull or are you hamburger meat? If you are not living with your mate, if you let the state raise your children, you are hamburger meat. It's only a matter of time until you are put to live in a cage. Bulls are in charge of their environment. They protect their mates and their offspring. They don't let anyone mess around with the herd. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if you've ever seen the yak or any of the Cape buffaloes. Whenever there's an attack, they circle and they put the females in the, in the epi, uh, not in the epicenter, the young go in the epicenter, the women are in the next center, and then the bulls are on the outside and they circle. We don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. Instead, we want to be Demi Moore. We want to be G.I. Jane. You want to be all that you can be, sisters. I know, sister, I know. Private Benjamin may have avoided getting her head shorn, but with the arrival of the clean-cut G.I. Jane, expect more A-list actresses to be heading to the barber chair for their country. Real time predicts the next recruits. And with that, in your Thursdays, come on, women on the march, see Jane Grunt, see Jane Groan. Formerly missing in Hollywood action, women now kick butt. Make y'all feel good, don't it? Now y'all can kick butt with the rest of them. Now you can carry around a symbolic dick just like Schwarzenegger and Stallone. And you could play at being boys. Why do you think they call it the Liberty? The New York Liberty. This is liberation. You see? And you got women now competing like men. Look at them, fighting, muscles, bulging, looking pumped, cut. My brother, if you like a woman cut and pumped, I question your masculinity. <laughs> because if you're laying in bed with a woman that has thicker abs, <laughs> thicker latissimus dorsi, harder than yours, I don't know about you brothers, but I don't want to have a backside that doesn't give when I hold it. I don't want to bounce a quarter off my woman's backside. You got a problem, brother, if you are walking down the street and that means all of that, and you could tell feminism was promoting that crap because you saw it on Montel William. When you saw this pumped up female that looked just two or three sizes shy of the Incredible Hulk, with a bathing suit, a bathing suit, two-piece. There was nothing there. 
she had pecs. Now, if you like to look at pecs, big as Schwarzenegger, with a little bra on, brother, 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 like Marvin says, you got a serious problem. And she had a man. Look at this. Dykes run their own protest on Fifth Avenue. Now, I want you to take a zoom of how many. There are over 10 to 50,000 of them. <laughs> zoom on that. Look at that. Where they coming from? He's the way they come from. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk about where they're coming from. Now, do you think that, I'm, you think that I, I'm, I'm off when I say that women are like calculators? They need information like computers. They need to be constantly uploading information. Well, they even wrote about that. Look at it. Living by the book. Shelves are crammed with new guides for us. The perplexed sex. The perplexed sex. Could you imagine? Why do you think there is a specific woman's section in all publishing houses now? Because you constitute the greatest consumers of information. My brother friend, Aleem, sent me this in the mail. Take a gander, and this is in my book as well. I want you to kind of focus in on these things that are walking around looking and pretending they look like women. This is in my book, The Wounded Womb, by the way. This is truly a real book. I just want you to know that. And I am doing my best to get it out for you. Good. All right. And it's coming soon. It is to a, to, a, to a something near you. We don't know yet. But it will be there. But look at this picture of this woman. Her name is Sue Price, a core of confidence. And she says, training with weights puts me in touch with my body. It's different sensations, both good and bad. Training pushes me to touch with my, get in touch with my core. What core? If the core ends up giving this, you know what her core was. This is a frightened woman. Probably had a very bad experience at being a woman. Didn't like being with men because men she couldn't trust. So what did she do? She went out and became one. And it always blows my mind how most of these women who are gay hate men so much that they look and act just like them. If I was hating something, I definitely would not want to be like that thing. Why would you want to dress like me? Why would you want to walk like me? Why would you even want to fuck like me? If you hated me so much. This guy says, some of these steroid-using women are three-quarters of the way to a sex change and don't know it. <laughs> now you want to know feminism is on the rise and feminism is all over the place? This takes place in a book and a magazine that was sent to me, and I believe it's Globe Photos, Globe um, Illustrations. I forgot the name of this particular magazine, but this magazine is deep. It's a white magazine, and it says, going where no man has gone before. Come on, y'all. I'm not making this shit up. This is what they want us as men to do. You don't want to carry babies anymore. You already said it in every, about four or five of these magazines. They already told you how they're going to put the babies. They're going to hire faggots to carry babies. And where they're going to put it? It's a specific place right off of the large intestines where it will grow. And then after it comes to term, will be removed by cesarean section. Now, since you, the white woman, won't, don't want to see, that's what this whole thing about this so-called uh, birth control war that's going on with the the white woman is asking the white man to pay for that baby that womb is now going to be rented at a high cost 
and he ain't having no more babies in that womb unless he pays her. That's part of the, uh, that was the deal they cut when they helped to destroy the civil rights movement. Now, if you want to have a baby, this pussy goes up in price. <laughs> but I want power. I just don't want the home. I don't want the Zsa, Zsa Gabor trappings. I want power. So what happens? What happens? Now, the Caucasian male must find new and improved ways to reproduce himself. He has artificial wounds. He is using sheep. He is using dogs. He is using all forms of animals, cows, uteruses, to incubate life. This is called transspecies fertilization. The using of animals to incubate babies and then transplanting the Near, uh, I think after the zygote goes whatever, after that particular point, taking that and then transplanting it in a host. This will be the new host. When Hillary Clinton runs for president, when the women can be coming to power, I'm leaving the country first of all, when they come to power, this will be promoted. Now, you hear it first here. We gave you a lot of firsts at the gathering of the masters. I'm giving you another first. This is from my book called The Epicene Enigma. Epicene means intersexuality, not knowing what sex you are. The Epicene Enigma, it's the secret reasons behind homosexuality and hermaphroditism, the one that they don't tell you about. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> but we ain't done. We ain't done. In Time Magazine, why are men and women different? What? <laughs> For 500,000 years, your peoples, your melanated great archetypal ancestors have already known this. Why are we different? Many scientists rely on elaborately complex and costly equipment to probe the mysteries confronting humankind. Not Melissa Hines. Look who's doing the studies, y'all. She wants to know why men and women are different so that she could understand what it is to gain power. Most of this information is information. It's to document for the control of whatever it is you are studying. The UCLA behavioral scientist is hoping to solve one of life's oldest riddles with a toy box full of police cars, Lincoln Logs, and Barbie dolls. For the past two years, Heinz and her colleagues have tried to determine the origins of gender differences by capturing on videotape the squeals of delight, furrows of concentration, and myriad decisions that children from two and a half to eight make while they're playing. Although both sexes play with all the toys available in Heinz's laboratory, her work confirms what most parents and more than a few aunts, uncles, and nursery school teachers already know. As a group, the boys favor sports cars, fire trucks, Lincoln logs, while the girls are drawn to the dolls and the kitchen toys. End, end of research. If in the beginning stages it was already confirmed that mothers already know, based on the fact that the genitals will tell you what they are, you don't need to know. If by nature, at four and five years old, a boy is showing what testosterone is going to look and act like, then yes, you help that to control that. And after seven years of age, you give it to the father. This was about the most organic picture I have that meant anything. And I wanted to kind of trigger some form of genetic memory for those sisters who are looking at this and those sisters who are deciding whether or not they're going to have a baby, understand that your body is the universal archetype. 
and that man, quote unquote, mem, and I don't mean man by male. Man is three Hebrew letters put together. Mem, alf, and nun. Mother, father, son. That's what man means. Okay? This is the most organic looking picture that I could find on the subject. And I know it's a shame. But every time I open up any of the common newspapers or any of the common garbage that is given to me, this is what I get, this crap. Specifically on this book, How to Be. Ladies, you obviously don't know <laughs> how to be. You need instructions. You need someone to tell you what to do. You have to have at least every six months another woman coming to tell you how to best do what you should be doing as a woman in this pathological environmental circumstance you call Western civilization. I open up to this point. From what I understand, sister says some very nice things. But then she says, same-sex relationships. Would it be fair to say black folks are often homophobic? She adopted the word homophobic. Where did she get that word? Does anybody think about where she got that word? By the way, she's one of those essence girls. <coughs> she came out of that stable. Uh, Harriet Cole, best-selling author of Jumping the Broom. <laughs> Any of you niggas out there want to jump a broom? I'm not doing your wedding for you. That's a slave legacy. You understand? Jump in a damn broom. <laughs> How is it? We, we, we keep the diet we ate when we were slaves. We keep doing the same dumb shit we did when we were slaves. We still go to church and worship a Jesus that was forced down our throats at the end of a whip and talk about how he saved us. The only reason he saved us is because the master wasn't whipping your ass when you were worshiping his God. All right. Would it be fair to say that black folks are homophobic? I think so. The labels that we often give to the gay community are frightening. Spiritually speaking, there are arguments that go back and forth about the legitimacy of the gay lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It has nothing to do with life. The reality is that many people in the black community are homosexual. And we're going to get to that. During the course of focus group work, <laughs> Focus group work, Whew. telling you. We discover that African-American homosexuals often feel ostracized from the community and abandoned by their families. Right. Interestingly enough, this is not the way we were, check it, that they, they were treated in some traditional African societies. Wait now. Among the Dagara of Burkina Faso, for example, Damn if I know. <laughs> they are given a very special role in the community that is spiritually based. Think, listen to me, listen. In spirit of intimacy, Sabanufu or sab, uh, Sobanfu Some says, the words gay and lesbian do not exist in the village, but there is the word gatekeeper. Gatekeepers are people who live a life at the edge of two worlds, the threshold of the gender line. They are mediators between the two genders. If the two genders are in conflict and the whole village is caught in it, the gatekeepers are the ones that bring peace. The life of gay people in the West is in many ways a reaction to pressure from a society that rejects them. In the village, they are not seen as the other. They are not forced to create a separate community in order to survive. People do not put a negative label on them. Homosexuality is seen in the village very differently than it is seen in the West, in part because all sexuality is spiritually based. She definitively says that. Now, she says in the next sentence, although among the Dagara, community ritual is not included as a part of the gatekeeper's evolution. Wait a minute. 
Yes, because up here it says that the special role in the community was spiritually based. I would believe that in this sentence, my sister, that when you say among the Dagara community ritual is not included as a part of the gatekeeper's evolution, I would believe that the spiritual information that you're imparting would have come from the fact that you were interfacing with the whole community and that you were getting your spiritual information from them. So here you are with your ass backward logic telling us this bullshit, especially our sisters, that it's all right to eat pussy. I got to be Frank, and I got to be Joe, and George, and I got to be the men who's got been sick and tired of this crap. How could you read this garbage, this duplicitous crap? And actually, she makes money with this. And who, who's the one publishing it? Simon, Simon and Schuster. Why was homosexuality something that was embraced? Because we embraced all pathology. And because we knew that that pathology was a sign of what was happening within the whole community, that you, if your family member was sick, the whole family took the medicine, whether they were sick or not. Because the whole family was based in that one person. And if it expressed itself in that one person, it meant that it was intrinsic to the whole family at that time. So you participated in the healing even though you did not show the symptoms. And the reason why these people were given a specific job is because we could always incorporate pathologies and use them to the positive, not the way they're using it today. Incredible. Ancient right, new fight. Now the sisters are fighting about the fact that a 10,000 year old ritual of taking off the clitoris is somehow something that you should be pissed off about. Let me tell you something, sisters. If your African secret societies, your African women who have secret societies in Africa have been doing this for 10,000 years, who the hell are you with your education to come and tell them what they were doing? And you got feminists like this uh, woman, uh, Alice, Alice Walker, going over there to tell them. They kicked her ass out and tell mind your own damn business. And why? Why? Because that was removed for the following reasons. Oh, just before this. This is Omni. They discontinued it. This is one of the last issues. The rationale, the bizarre, and the uncertain future of gender. <laughs> this is the woman being put into a machine, and the machine is cranking out the baby now. And the machine is telling the baby what it is, male or female. You can choose your own child now. Brown eyes, blue eyes, long hair, short hair, chubby, skinny, whatever. Sister, Caribbean sister, tells me that there are six steps for personal change in women. Listen to them. Willingness. The strong desire and intention to modify an aspect of your life. Two, awareness. Paying attention to what we do and say with the openness to change what isn't working. Three, allowing an emotion, behavior, or trait to exist without judging it. Four, release. Various forms of expression that entails letting go. Five, transformation. Integrating new choices and decisions for how we want to live. Six, behavior change. Daily positive practices that lead to living a new way. Ain't not a damn thing about your relationship with a man. Well, they say, well, when we get ourselves together, then we're ready. How can we be ready for the man and not get ourselves together? That's 25 years ago, sisters. 25, no, 30 years later, and we still don't know. You're still searching. You're still wondering why you have fibroid tumors. You're wondering why get breast cancer is the epidemic for the new millennium. You're wondering why it is that so many women now are suffering at a rate 150 times or 150% greater, huh? 150% greater than your great grandmothers. Why is that? Well, my last little uh, piece of, uh, what do you call it, work, 
was something that I wanted to give to you, and I'm hoping I didn't lose it, because this one is absolutely flawless. And I'll find it. If I can't find it now, I'll find it for afterwards, and then I'll get to it, and uh, we'll share it. That's the one? No. No, it's not the one. All right, we'll move on. Okay. Get out your pencil and paper, sisters. Oh, not that test, right? Yeah. We're going to do the test. You have to do the test, and I will have it for sale there on the table so that you can actually go over not only the reasons why you are having the problem with Candida, or if you have it at all, but we're going to discuss why menstrual cycles is actually a disease, a pathology that has been in, uh, inherited by our sisters of today, and it's what I call a complacent pathology. We no longer feel that we need to fight it. It's an inevitability. Girls from nine years of age to about, what, 45 do it? 50, they do it, so that's what it is. The Candida test is one that was actually put together by Dr. Wendell Hoffman from the Hoffman Research Institute in Utah. Now, dealing with Candida albicanus yeast, am I correct in that? Okay, that's, I have to clear it with my, uh, the, the interpreter here. Uh, I prefer to call it, um, pathogenic albicanus yeast, <laughs> you know? But we'll look at it from this perspective. Candida is probably one of the most misdiagnosed or unquote unquote diagnosed diseases out there. Candida can imitate any of the common pathologies that you suffer from now. It can, can, it can imitate migraine, it can imitate heart palpitations, high blood pressure, kidney dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, liver dysfunction, all of these have a base in candida. So what we want to do is to go over this particular test. Of course, I'll have it available so that you could do it at home with, your, with sisters and brothers as well. Now, with this particular test, you will put down specific points that you will add up at the end. When I answer, ask you this question, if the answer is a yes, then you add 25 points. You understand? Have you taken tetracyclines, such as semicin, pamicin, vibromycin, myosin, and other antibiotics for the flu, for acne, or for any other form of uh, vaginal distress? That's 25 points. Two, have you at any time in your life taken a, any other broad spectrum antibiotics for urinary, respiratory, or other quote unquote infections for two months or longer, or in shorter causes for more times than over a period of a year? In other words, have you taken them in a successive period of time for like a couple of weeks over about once or twice, two times in the year? If you have, put 20 points down. Have you taken a broad spectrum antibiotic even in a single course? That is during a period in just one illness in the year. You just put six points for that. Have you at any time in your life been bothered by persistent prostitis, vaginitis, or other problems affecting your reproductive organs? That's 25 points. Have you ever been pregnant? One time, put three points. Two or more times, put five points. Have you ever had an abortion? Once, put 10 times. Two or more times, put 25 points. Have you ever taken birth control pills for six months to two years at a time? Put eight points. If you've done it for more than two years, put down 15 points. Does exposure to perfumes cooking foods, insecticides, fabric shop odors, 
dry cleaning fumes and other chemicals provide moderate to severe symptoms, put 20 points. If they are mild symptoms, put five points. Have you ever taken prednisone, decadron, and other cortisone types drugs for two weeks or less, put six points. For more than two weeks, put 15 points. Are your symptoms worsened by damp, muggy days, or on moldy days, or in moldy places? I'm sorry. Put 20 points. Have you ever had athlete's foot, ringworms, jock itch, or other chronic fungal infections of the skin or the nails? Are the infections severe or persistent? You put 20 points. If they're mild, put 10 points. Do you crave Do you crave sugar? Put 10 points. Do you crave breads? Put 10 points. Do you crave alcoholic beverages? Put 10 points. Does tobacco smoke really bother you? I need to put 20 points for that one. For me, put 10 points. For the following symptoms that I name off, score yourself honestly and accordingly. Now, if it's occasional to mild, put down three points. If it's frequent or, or moderately severe, put six points. If it's severe or disabling, put down nine points. Do you have a lot of fatigue? If it's occasional or if it's mild, put three. Severe, put six. If it's severe and disabling, put nine. Do you feel drained a lot? Do you have poor memory? Do you feel detached or spaced out? Do you feel depression? How about numbness, burning, or tingling? Persistent muscle aches, muscle weakness or paralysis, pain and or swelling in the joints, abdominal pains, consistent, bloating, Okay. Troublesome vaginal discharges. 3609. Persistent vaginal burning or, or aching or itching. Impotence. Loss of sexual drive. Cramps or irregular menstruals. Endometriosis premenstrual tensions, spots in front of your eyes, fading or erratic vision, diarrhea, dizziness. For the following symptoms, score them appropriately. If it's occasional to mild, put one point. If it's frequent or moderately severe, put two. If it's disabling, put three. Drowsiness. Irritability, lack of coordination, inability to concentrate, mood swings, headaches, eye pain or infrequent deafness, constant itching, rashes, heartburn, indigestion, constant belching, mucus in stools, blisters in your mouth, bad breath. Nasal congestion, post-nasal drip, sore and dry throat, constant dry cough, and this goes for non-smokers, pain and tightness in the chest, wheezing and shortness of breath, frequent urination, burning while urination, loss of vision, burning teary eyes, recurrent infections or fluid in the ears, pressure above ears, feeling of swelling in the head, tingling and ringing in the ears. Now, your total score can help you decide if the symptoms you are persistently suffering from are yeast related. Scores for women would normally run higher because seven to eight categories apply exclusively to women, while two to three apply exclusively to men. The scores, 180, for women and 140 for men, 
Definitely yeast related. 120 for women, 90 for men, probably yeast connected. 60 for women, 40 for men, possibly yeast connected. Under 60 for women, 40 for men, probably not yeast connected. Now, it'll be fun for you to give yourself a chance to do the test while we are on our break, to add up and then take an assessment of your total. Okay? Now we're going to have questions and answer after the break, but I want to start speaking about the menstrual cycle. In the ancient of days, women did not menstruate. The menstruation was called the artificial or the unnatural abortion. Every time you lose an egg, the ancestors considered that an abortion or a miscarriage. The loss of a potential child was just as severe to the female body as the loss of an actual being. Because every time you create an egg from your corpus luteum, you create or you, do, you lose an aspect of your life force. The ancient women used to reabsorb the egg through specific rituals of the mind and the breath. The loss of blood, any amount of blood, is a hemorrhage, plain and simple. If anyone is teaching you, my sister, that that is your badge of womanhood, that is the height of ignorance. Today, the pathology of young girls seven, eight, and nine having their menstrual cycle shows just how low and pathological the strain of humanity has become. Losing your blood is not natural, but it is normal. When the disease was not in fashion, it was unnatural and abnormal. When you bled, it was unnatural and abnormal. Women built huts. Women built healing centers, healing spaces for this particular pathology. And women were documented by the white doctors who came and met with your ancestral women. They said that if menstruation did take place, it happened twice to three times a year. A year. The only person that was bleeding in profuse amounts was the Caucasian woman who came over with the pathology she brought as the legacy of the Black Plague and the continual disease syndromes that they suffered from in Europe after they drove the Moors out. The menstrual cycle, my beloved sisters, when you lose the lining, the endometrial lining, constantly, over and over and over again, you strip and lose the blood, the, 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 the um, what is that substance? Brain creating, the, grain, the brain substance is in the blood for creating that child. Um, the cholesterol, uh, all of the substances that come out with your leucoria, that leucoria is the nutrition that is exuded by the cells in the uterus. When you have the heavy leucoric discharges, when you bleed and have these leucoric discharges, all these forms of discharges, your body is marshalling nutrition or marshalling these components to an area that is weak and has been encumbered with waste and filth and has become enervated and fatigued by the actions that you are taking today as the new 90s millennium woman. You are fatigued, my sisters. And every time you bleed, you strip the lining, that precious lining necessary for that child. The precious lining necessary for you to create a genius. Why is it that women who have, who naturally bring their menstrual cycle down are healthier. I'm not talking about unnaturally bringing it down, like some of these amenorrheic, 
uh, females who play basketball and sports. You will be seeing a football league. There is a basketball and there is a boxing commission for women. Look at how low the feminine principle has stooped to imitate men in the arenas of combat and cause that equality. These women are being marketed with Nike sneakers the same way they market Michael Jordan. So the new heroes for your sisters is not ones wearing dresses, but wearing basketball shorts and football helmets. These are going to be the new way that they are going to market feminism to your sisters. And this is where the damage is going to be sorely made. Every time you sisters run or jog, you jaw and bump and knock about a specific organ that is attached to each side of your body by suspensory ligaments. 